came this afternoon because you want to hear about Noah and those pesky dinosaurs. Well, you know what? They don't have to be as pesky as they may have been. But I've heard many people over the years uh, say, you know, my kids asked me about dinosaurs. I just told them uh, they don't exist. And they go, well, then how come I see pictures of them? Or God put them there just to test our faith. And it's like, well, God doesn't deal with fantasy. He deals with reality. So let's look from a biblical perspective. How can we understand the issue of dinosaurs and Noah's flood? We're going to tie both of those together in this one presentation. So we start off a little bit of introduction, acknowledgments, purpose again. I'm going to quickly take you again through this, examining the evidence. We did this last night, but we'll look at it again for the sake of the people who weren't here. What is the evidence that we have for a global flood? We have some observations from science, from different disciplines of science. We're going to refer this evidence and compare it to what the scripture tells us. We have to look at some of the post-flood evidences from after Noah's flood. We want to draw reasonable conclusions. We want to look at some of the resources also that are available. So really quickly, again, here's a list of acknowledgments. I want to pay tribute to the Arizona Origin Science Association. And again, just as this morning and yesterday, the purpose of this presentation is to build up your faith in the authority of the Word of God. Does God say what he means and does he mean what he says? We talked about how do we examine evidence? How does a scientist or anyone examine evidence? Because we all have a starting point for our thinking. And it can go by a variety of different names. Bias, faith, presupposition, axiom, paradigm, worldview, just to name most of them. And we said that the two bias options that we have when looking at the evidence we have around us about how did everything get here, our two bias options are that either the Bible is true or the Bible is not true. Now, on one occasion, Dr. Chittick, who, uh, as I mentioned the other night, uh, was a, a mentor of mine. He went to a meeting one time, and somebody in the back of the room stood up and raised his hand. And he says, there's a third possibility. He says, you can be an agnostic. And Dr. Chittick said, sir, even an agnostic has to agnosticate between the Bible being true or the Bible being not true. Okay, So it still gets down to those two. And you have a body of evidence. And the person who believes that the Bible is true could look at that particular evidence and say, what I see here tells me that there was a creative intelligence, that would be God, and a worldwide flood. The person who believes the Bible is not true can look at the various evidence and convince themselves that what they're seeing is really random processes operating over long periods of time. This is because of their preconceived bias and, uh, or worldview, paradigm, however you want to call it. And everyone, including scientists, have a bias for their thinking. So again, the question we have to ask ourselves is, does it agree with reality? Are the conclusions we reach supported by our observations and the total body of evidence that we see? Because either everything was created or everything created itself, and there cannot be two realities. One of these options is true, and the other is fantasy. And truth is that which conforms to reality. So... To illustrate that, we have these two people here, the biblical person and the secular person. And the person who believes that the Bible is true and who believes that God's word is true can look at something like the Grand Canyon and say, wow, that's evidence of a powerful flood that carved that canyon. Whereas the person on the right who believes that man decides truth can say, no, it probably took millions and millions of years. All right. So either the supreme omniscient God God of the Bible determines truth, or sinful, degenerate, rebellious man decides truth. Okay. Now, we also talked briefly about the difference between observational science, things that we can observe in the present. These are, these are when we do rigorous testing, and we take measurements, and we record the data, and we look at how things operate in the present. And we said that it was observable. We can see it. It's testable. We can set up a test to see how it behaves under certain conditions. It's repeatable. Other people can perform the same experiments and, in theory, should get the same results. And it should be predictable. We should be able to make predictions based upon our results and then do more tests to confirm whether our predictions are correct. That is called observational science as compared to historical science. Historical science is when we look at something in the present and try to come up with an explanation as to how it got to be where it is. Okay. You might say we're going to come up with a story, okay, or we're going to come up with an account. Well, if I'm going to trust an account of something as to how it got there, I don't have to 
come up with, I don't have to trust man's ideas, I can go to this first and make this the foundation for my thinking in every area. So the first thing we have to establish is that Noah's flood was global. There are some Christians and some churches who teach that Noah's flood was only a local event. It really didn't cover the whole world, it was just a local event, okay? Now why would they say that? Well, they want to say that because they want all of those fossils and all those rock layers to represent millions of years. And so if they admit that Noah's flood was global, then that does away with their whole idea of wanting to have millions of years. But Genesis 7, starting in verse 18, tells us, The water prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. Verse 19, The waters prevailed more and more upon the earth, so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heaven were covered. Now, try to imagine what this would look like as a local flood. Okay, all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens are covered, but it was a local flood. Well, thanks to Photoshop, we can put together what that would look like, and it would look like something like this. Okay, uh, does this represent anything close to reality? You, well, you would instinctively say, no, I know that water always seeks its own level. It doesn't create conditions like this. So we can say, that based on the Bible, no, if it said it covered the whole world, then it covered the whole world. Now, something else we need to consider this is, oh, is that the flood did not last for 40 days. Say, what? Wait a minute, I thought the Bible talked about 40 days. Well, let's go to God's word and look carefully at what it says. Genesis 7, 11, it says, in the 600th, 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open, and the flood the gates of sky were open. Okay, we've got that. Then in verse 12, it says, the rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Okay, we've got that. Verse 17, then the flood came upon the earth for 40 days, and the water increased and lifted up the ark so that it rose above the earth. So the 40-day period was how long it took from the initial starting of the flood until Noah's ark became waterborne, okay? It, didn't it wasn't like just filling up the bathtub and whoosh, next thing you know, he's off and floating away. It took 40 days. So just to begin to build this scenario, okay, during those 40 days, you're gonna have the tides are still gonna be in effect. And each time the tide comes in, it's gonna bring in more mud, more debris, and it's gonna lay stuff down, and then it's gonna come in again 12 hours later, and again 12 hours later, more and more surges, until eventually the ark, after 40 days, was raised above the earth. Now, the next verse, verse 18, the water prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. So, keep that in mind. Now, we're gonna to go to Genesis seven nineteen. The waters prevailed more and more upon the earth so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. Okay, we've established that. Verse 24, the water prevailed upon the earth 150 days. So that's about five months. So for five months, the water kept going up and up and up, higher and higher. Then that brings us up to chapter 8, verse 1. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark, and God caused the wind to pass over the earth, and the water subsided. Also, in verse 2, it says, The fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were closed. When? After the 150 days. And the rain from the sky was restrained. When? After the 150 days. And the water receded steadily from the earth, and at the end of 150 days, the water decreased. So there we go. So 40 days is mentioned, but it wasn't like the beginning and the end of the flood. The whole flood event lasted for 13 months. Okay, It was a big deal. So, now, that being said, if there was indeed a devastating worldwide flood as described in Genesis chapter 6, 7, 8, what sort of evidence should we expect to find? At the very least, we should expect to find sedimentary rock layers, and many of those would contain fossils all over the earth. There's actually a song, and you're going to hear that a little bit later with Rick and Sydney. Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. That is what we should expect to find. And in addition, we should expect to find close to 300 known flood legends from cultures around the world. As Noah and his sons got off the ark and as they repopulated the earth and as they dispersed from Babel, then they would have had a recollection, recollection of the events that took place before them and they would have told them to their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren and so on. And these would have continued as 
legends or stories, but look at how similar some of these elements are to the biblical account. From Hawaii comes the story of Nu'u. A human couple, Nu'u and Lily Noe, survived a flood on top of Mauna Kea on the Big Island. Nu'u made sacrifices to the moon to whom he mistakenly attributed his safety. Kane, the creator god, descended to earth on a rainbow and explained Nu'u's mistake and accepted his sacrifice. Now, why would they have incorporated elements of the Genesis account? Okay. And why does it vary? Well, it varies because over time, things get corrupted. But God said that he would preserve his word so that his truth could continue on from generation to generation. From Mexico, the Aztecs have a story. A man named Tapi lived a long time ago. Tapi was a very pious man. The creator told Tapi to build a boat that he would live in. He was told that he should take his wife and a pair of every animal that was alive into the boat. Naturally, everyone thought he was crazy. Then the rain started and the flood came. The men and animals tried to climb the mountains, but the mountains became flooded as well. Finally, the rain ended. Toppy decided that the waters had dried up when he let a dove loose that did not return. Hmm, how interesting. The Toltecs of Mexico have a legend telling that the original creation lasted for 1,716 years and was destroyed by a flood and only one family survived. And by the way, when we use the biblical account, it adds up to 1,656 years, not too far off the mark. From China comes the story of Fu Hai. Fu Hai, his wife, three sons, and three daughters escaped the Great Flood. He and his family were the only people alive on Earth. After the Great Flood, they repopulated the world. The Chinese consider Fu Hai the father of their civilization. And in fact, there are some people who have done some study on the ancient Chinese language, and they found that the, the oldest Chinese hieroglyphic characters in their language derive from biblical events. For instance, in China, this is the symbol for boat. It is a composite of three other symbols. The three other symbols are vessel, the number eight, and a symbol for mouths or people. Now, why would the ancient Chinese have used a vessel with eight people as a symbol for a boat? Unless they had the Genesis account of history go with them at the beginning of their culture. Another interesting little sideline too, in China, in the, in, in, this is ancient Chinese now, the symbol for two trees combined with the symbol for one woman was the ancient Chinese symbol for to desire or to covet. Now why would the ancient Chinese have used a woman and two trees to represent coveting? Well, the implication is simply this. At one time, these cultures, all of them, had the original story of creation and the flood, but it became corrupted as they lost their true heritage. We could ask the question, has the United States of America lost its true heritage? And we have to go back to our founding documents to realize that it says we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. All right, next let's look at the lifespan of the patriarchs. We took a quick look at this the other day. When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness after his image named him Seth. The days of Adam after he became the father of Seth were 800 years and he had other sons and daughters. We talked about that last night. Thus all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. Okay, so we have this chart here and we have Adam at the top, okay? And it says here that he lived 900 and some odd years, and we go down the list. And then, of course, we get to, uh, we skipped over Enoch there. We get to Methuselah, 969 years. Okay, and like I say, we had Enoch there. But what does that have to do with dinosaurs? Okay, why? We had men, humans, living 900 plus years. Okay, and we're looking at the issue of dinosaurs. The significant difference between growth in reptiles and that in mammals is that a reptile has the potential of growing throughout its life, whereas a mammal reaches a terminal size and grows no more, even though it may subsequently live many years in ideal conditions. So it says that a reptile has the potential of growing throughout its life. So is it possible to have big reptiles? Well, even today in the Amazon, in some remote place in Africa, they're finding very large reptiles. This information, by the way, comes from Encyclopedia Britannica. All right, we understand that about 1,656 years after creation, 
the entire earth was covered by a massive flood, the likes of which had never been seen before or since. We also know from our own scientific observation that much of the earth is covered by layers of sedimentary rock. Sedimentary rock, in case you're a little bit rusty in your geology, is sediment, rock that's laid down by grains of sand or other rocks in water and then it solidifies, okay, it becomes like concrete. And many of those rocks contain fossils, and many of the fossils are almost identical to today's fossils, that we have, the creatures that we have left today, except that some of them were huge. Or like this shark's jaw. This shark could have devoured the shark from jaws very easily. We even have fossilized insects, like this dragonfly. You say, well, yeah, I've run into dragonflies before. Have you ever encountered one with a three-foot wingspan? Cockroaches. I've seen cockroaches. I've seen some big cockroaches. Well, just how big do we mean? Well, how about maybe as big as your foot or your shoe? Okay. And we know that coal contains organic material buried beneath the Earth's surface. And we know that there are coal seams found on every continent of the Earth. In fact, one coal bed in Wyoming is over 100 feet thick. That is a lot of plant material to be buried and compressed to get it down to 100 feet thick. And in fact, on the very southeastern tip off of Australia is an area known as the Gippsland Basin. There is a coal seam there that is almost three miles in thickness. That is a lot of plant material to be buried. In fact, um, geologists say that the amount of coal and oil we have can't be made by all of the plants that we have alive on the planet today. So the pre-flood world must contain an enormous tropical vegetation. At the same time, we know that dinosaurs did exist. What proof of there? Well, some of the best proof we have is because we find their fossil remains. And some of them were pretty big too. Here's a, some of them compared to an elephant including Tyrannosaurus rex. And please notice this human male down here for scale. All right, last night we had a pop quiz. We're gonna have another pop quiz. T-Rex had teeth six inches long. How would this creature have originally been classified? Would it have been A, as a plant eater, or B, as a meat eater, or C, as a plant and meat eater, or D, as a scavenger? Think about that. Oh, we're good. We're not going to play a theme song for you. All right. Now, we're going to make the Bible the foundation for our thinking in every area. But before we do that, let's ask. Raise your hand. How many of you think that T-Rex was originally a plant eater? How many of you think he was originally a meat eater? How many of you think he originally was a plant and meat eater? How many of you think he was a scavenger? How many of you are afraid to vote? Okay. We say we're going to make the Bible the foundation for our thinking in every area. Okay, let's go back to day six, Genesis 1.24. Then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. God, verse 25, God made the beasts of the earth after their kind and the cattle after their kind and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. And God saw that it was good. So what did God make of the land creatures? He made every land creature that existed. And then... He says, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw all that he had made. Behold, it was very good. There was evening, there was morning, the sixth day. So, the Bible tells us that every beast, and every bird, and everything that moved was given green plants to eat. So, it wasn't a trick question. You just had to be careful to catch the word originally been classified. And we would say, oh yeah, meat eater. Well, I mean, those are huge teeth. Well, you know what? If you're gonna eat a melon whole, maybe having teeth like that wouldn't be so bad. But again, when we start with the Bible as our foundation of thinking in every area, it's not hard to understand. So we need to build our thinking on God's word, not the opinions and beliefs of fallible, sinful, rebellious human beings. And that would include scientists. And again, we're here to defend the authority of God's word when it's seen to others. Now, I give this church sometimes in churches not affiliated with the Seventh-day Adventist church, and they don't prescribe to a vegetarian diet necessarily. And that leaves some of them really scratching their heads. They're like, you mean all the animals were originally vegetarian? 
Yes, and we don't have a problem understanding that. Isaiah 11.6 tells us, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. Well, somebody says, yeah, well, that's referring to the earth made new. Mm-hmm. Has anybody here ever heard of the story of little tyke? The true story of the gentle vegetarian lioness. Raise your hand if you have a few. Good, man. A, a majority of you. That's nice. I have this book in both paperback and hardback, right? And you know how they tried to feed little tyke. You know, they tried mixing a little bit of blood in with the milk. And she wouldn't take it and tried to feed it meat. Wouldn't take it and everything. And, and uh, it amazed... Okay, all of the people, not just her owners, but uh, the veterinarians and everything else. All right, so what about the dinosaurs, okay? How do they fit in with the Bible? Well, they fit in a lot easier than you might think. If we start with answering a few questions, beginning with the Bible as the basis for our thinking. So, the term dinosaur means what? We all know this one. Terrible lizard. Okay, now, lizards are classified as what? They are classified as reptiles okay we have to ask the question are reptiles alive today yes so how many different kinds of animals was Noah instructed to take on board the ark two of most every oh wait it says two of every okay so Noah was taking reptiles on the ark can we establish that not a problem okay now let's continue and it says in Genesis six seventeen going to bring a flood. Verse 18, but with thee I will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come to the ark, thou thy sons, thy wife, thy sons wife with thee, and two of every living thing of all flesh, two of every kind thou shalt bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female. So when Noah was instructed by God to bring two of every, it meant two of every. And take food, and thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. So let's just throw in this question here. What about bugs and insects? Did he have to bring two of every little bug and insect as well? Well, no. Let's look again at the Bible. It says Genesis 7 in verse 21. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beasts and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth and every man. And then it tells us all in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was on the dry land died. All in whose nostrils was the breath of life. So, how do insects breathe? Do they have nostrils? No, they do not. Insects breathe through a complex network of air tubes called trachea that open to the outside through a series of small valved apertures, spiracles, along the sides of their bodies. So, they don't respirate like we do. They don't breathe, okay? It's more of a passive uh, air exchange system, okay? Now, why do I have those dinosaurs on Noah's Ark? And it repeated twice. Something wrong with that slide. Oh, well. Dinosaurs were huge, right? Well, yes, the big ones were. But let's use some simple reasoning here. Okay. Dinosaurs are terrible. Lizards, we established that. And lizards hatch from what? Eggs. Okay, we know that. The largest dinosaur egg to be discovered was no bigger than that of a football. Okay, so a baby dinosaur, the biggest baby dinosaur would come out of an egg the size of a football. Dinosaur eggs vary in size and shape from small and spherical to a, like a ping pong ball to large and ovoid like a football. The biggest eggs found so far appear to have come from a hypsilosaurus. They're about 30 centimeters long by 25 centimeters wide, would have contained about two liters or half a gallon of egg white and egg yolk. So, weren't the dinosaurs all huge? Well, not automatically, not if they started off small. Some were as small as chickens, while others were even smaller. Of course, some dinosaurs were very large, weighing in at an estimated 80 tons and standing 40 feet high. The average size of a dinosaur, however, was probably about that of a small horse. Some people would say a sheep or maybe a large dog. Well, would there have been enough room on Noah's Ark for the dinosaurs and the other land animals? With room to spare, actually. Uh, it was 437 feet long, approximately, 73 feet wide, 44 feet high, bigger than a 747, okay? Well, let's ask ourselves, what did Noah's Ark look like? Now, I have not had the opportunity to step into the creator role room here in this church, okay? But I have become acquainted with the fact that there are some churches 
who have an illustration of Noah's Ark somewhere that looks like this, okay? This kind of illustration makes a parody of the Ark and the historical account of the flood, okay? And as a former reading teacher, I know that first impressions, especially with very young children, make a very strong, uh, very strong on the impressionable minds. And when a young person sees this, and then they begin to build their paradigm of the Bible and the flood of Noah around this, they're thinking, that's kind of silly. How could Noah do that? How can he? And giraffes sticking their necks out of the top and everything else. Okay, so um, I'm going to operate on the premise that we won't find this here, okay? Uh, what we would find should be something more like this. And this is comparison to a few of the railroad cars, just to show in a school bus and a man and a sauropod dinosaur, or maybe something more like this. Now, how many of us have a set of the My Bible Friends series? Okay, My Bible Friends, they have an account of Noah. I like the way this illustrator put it in. He's got it so big that you can't even see both ends of the ark at the same time, okay? The ark was huge, okay? So huge, like I said, you can't even see it that way. Now, a little bit earlier, I showed you this picture. This was an actual photograph, hasn't been embellished. This was the evening before the ark encounter exhibit in Kentucky opened to the public. God says, I'm gonna give you a nice, beautiful sunset just to, just to kind of get people's attention here. There was a book published by John Wood Morapic called Noah's Ark, A Feasibility Study. In it, he says the total available floor space on the ark would have been over 100,000 square feet, which would have been more floor space than 20 standard sized basketball courts. The total cubic volume would have been 1,518,000 cubic feet. That would have been equal to the capacity of 569 modern railroad stock cars, each of which can hold 240 sheep. I've once in a while, and maybe some of you have been caught at a railroad crossing when the train went by, and what's the first thing we do? We try to look off to the side and say, how far, can we see the end of the train coming? How long are we gonna be sitting here? Okay, imagine 569 railroad cars going by. It would take you a while, right? You'll be sitting there. Uh, that would be a total of about 136,560 sheep. But how many animals would have been involved in Noah's Ark? Wood Merapi tallied up about 8,000 genera, including extinct genera, thus about 16,000 people, add a little more for the clean animals, where there would have been seven aboard the Ark. Is there any proof that dinosaurs survived the flood? Well, let's start by going back to God's word in the book of Job, chapter 40. He's talking to Job, right? He steps into the narrative, okay? After Job's friends have done their thing and Job's tried to argue with them and he hasn't been made any headway and they haven't been able to convince Job that you're just a sinner and you're holding out on us, God steps into the narrative. He says, sit back, I'm gonna ask you a few questions. And he asks a series of questions. Some people say 77, I counted a few more than that, but then he gets to chapter 40, and he says now to Job, Behold now behemoth which I made with thee. He eateth grass as an ox, okay, a plant eater. Lo now, his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. Sounds like a pretty formidable dude. Verse 17, He moveth his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. Verse 18, His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. And then he says, he is the chief of the ways of God. So let's look at that verse, the chief of the ways of God. The word that translated chief is the Hebrew word reshith, and it means when translated, the first, the beginning, the best, the chief, okay, the choicest part, okay. So God is saying, I'm going to hold up this example of this critter which I made along with you as an example. Can you explain this critter for me? Of course, we know that Job wasn't able to, right? The word behemoth. The word is most likely a plural form of behema, an animal. It may be an example of what's called pluralis excellente, a Hebrew method of expressing greatness by pluralizing a noun. It thus indicates that behemoth is the largest and most powerful animal that Job would have referenced. Well, if I'm God and I want to make a point to Job, I'm going to use the best reference I can, okay? And if uh, you go on and you look at some of these Bible commentaries online, it talks about it, and then it says, uh, Diplodocus or Brachiosaurus, exact meaning unknown. And then it says, some translate as elephant or hippopotamus, but from the description of Job 40, 15, verse 24, this is patently absurd. 
And again, I get mine from the blueletterbible.com. But the New International Version, when it came out, had a footnote saying that behemoth is the elephant or the hippopotamus. Now, why would they say that? Behold now, behemoth, he moveth his tail like a cedar. Have any of you ever visited a zoo and seen the southbound end of a northbound elephant? Okay. This is not a cedar tree. Has anybody ever seen the southbound tail of a northbound hippo? Even worse, not a cedar tree. I come from the Pacific Northwest where they have Pacific red cedars. This is what a cedar tree looks like, okay? So let's take something that looks like a cedar tree and slap it on the end of an elephant. Nah, not so good, right? Uh, what about the end of a hippo? No, not so good. How about we take a sauropod and stick it on there and we say, wow, that works rather nicely, doesn't it? Okay. Now, the Bible also describes a creature called Leviathan. Job 3, verse 8. Let those curse it who curse the day who are prepared to rouse Leviathan. Another creature that God is mentioning here. This is the early part of Job. Job 41, this is God speaking. Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord? But in Psalms also, it talks about you crushed the head of Leviathan. You gave him as food for creatures of the wilderness. And in Psalm 104, it mentions, there the ships move along in Leviathan, which you formed to sport in it. So uh, the psalmist is saying that Leviathan was a sea creature because it's out there where the ships are. And God formed it to sport around in the ocean. Isaiah 27, in that day, the Lord will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, with his fierce and great mighty sword, even Leviathan, the twisted serpent. And he will kill the dragon who lives in the sea. Oh, dragon lives in the sea. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. So the Bible also describes a creature which it calls a fiery flying serpent in Isaiah 14, verse 29. Rejoice not thou, whole Philistia, because of the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root shall come forth a viper, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. Fiery flying serpent. Isaiah 30, verse 6, talking about the same thing. Fiery flying serpent. Could this possibly be describing a pteranodon? Fiery flying serpent. But... Somebody says the word Bible or the word dinosaur, excuse me, isn't in the Bible. This is true. The word dinosaur is not found in any translation that I'm aware of. By the year 1841, about nine types of these different reptiles have been uncovered, including two called Megalosaurus and Iguanodon. At this time, a famous British scientist, and he was a creationist also, Dr. Richard Owen, coined the term dinosauria, meaning terrible lizard. Now, this was in the year 1841. Does anybody recall what year the King James Bible was translated in? 1611, okay, that was 230 years before the term dinosaur was discovered. So we wouldn't expect it to be in the King James Version, and we consequently really shouldn't expect it to be in other translations. But then, if that being the case, what word does the Bible use to refer to dinosaurs? We've already come across it a little bit. The word is dragons. Dragons. The Bible talks about dragons in many places. In the King James Version, the word dragon appears 19 times in 18 different verses. It shows up in Nehemiah. It shows up in Psalms. It shows up in Isaiah. shows up in Jeremiah. And in Isaiah, it talks about the dragon that is in the sea. Could this be a reference to a plesiosaur? Possibly. We know plesiosaurs exist because we have their fossils. So let's go back and look at Genesis 121. In the King James Version, it says, And God created great whales, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly. The New King James Version calls them sea creatures. The New Living Translation calls them sea creatures. The New International Version calls them creatures of the sea. The English Standard Version calls them sea creatures. And Webster's Bible translates it as whales. Okay, The word they're describing is this one here called tannin. And it translates as dragon 21 times. So let's look at Genesis 21. The New American Standard translates it as sea monsters. The Revised Standard Version translates it as sea monsters. The American Standard Version translates it as sea monsters. And Young's Living Translation calls it monsters. And Darby's Translation calls it sea monsters again. So, again, all translations end verse Genesis 21, and God saw that it was good. Okay, so... Whether you want to call them creatures or monsters, whatever, God made them, and he said they were good, okay? 
And they would have been good before man's fall. The New American Standard, just again here, this is Matthew 12, verse 40, New American Standard. This is Jesus talking, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And since Jesus said it, we'll put it in red too. Again, I want to give a special thanks to the Blue Letter Bible. That's what I use as my translations. But again, you're free to use any, but I just let you know where I got mine. All right, so is there any other evidence of dinosaurs living after Noah's flood? Well, we have dragon legends, just like we have flood legends that talk about people groups and how they got to be where they are. There are also dragon legends. What are some of them? Well, let's take a look. There's a Sumerian story dating back to 2000 BC or more tells of a hero named Gilgamesh who, when he went to fell cedars in a remote forest, encountered a huge vicious dragon which he slew, cutting off its head as a trophy. When Alexander the Great, 330 BC, and his soldiers marched into India, they found that the Indians worshipped huge hissing reptiles that they kept in caves. China is renowned for its dragon stories, and dragons are prominent on Chinese pottery, embroidery, and carvings. England has its story of St. George, who, drew, who slew a dragon that lived in a cave. This wasn't St. George, Utah, by the way. There is a story of a 10th century Irishman who wrote of his encounter with what appears to have been a stegosaurus. In the 1500s, okay, a European scientific book, Historia Animalium, listed several animals that we would call dinosaurs as still alive. A well-known naturalist at the time, Ulysses Aldrovandas, recorded an encounter between a peasant named Baptista and a dragon whose description fits that of the small dinosaur Tanistrophius. The encounter was on 13 May 1572 near Bologna in Italy, and the peasant killed the dragon. We also have dragons in art. And the Vikings. Not my alma mater, Portland State University Vikings. Not the Minnesota Vikings. We're talking the Viking Vikings, okay? And then we have something very interesting from Central America called the Ica Stones. This is another example of Uparts, which we touched on briefly last night. These carvings on these rocks, and there's thousands of them, and many of them show carvings of dinosaurs, and some have people with, some with people and dinosaurs together on the same rock. Now, of course, when the evolutionists were asked about this, they said, well, these must be frauds. They were local farmers carving these things so they could sell them to tourists and make money. But when they were examined scientifically, they said there's an oxidation on these rocks that must make them at least a couple hundred years old. Well, a couple hundred years ago, these peasant farmers, okay, in Peru were not getting a book that said millions of dinosaurs roamed the earth and here's what they look like. Here's one, looks like the dinosaur is taking a nip off the guy's leg. Here's one riding a long neck dinosaur. But there are other examples as well. This is a Mesopotamian cylinder seal. And what they would do is they would lay down wax and then roll this seal over it. And notice, two long neck dinosaurs with their necks intertwining. There's also this shield that came from Egypt. There was also, in Cambodia, as they began to excavate the jungle, they found this famous temple of Angkor Wat. And on this temple, as they began to clear it away, they came across a pillar with a very unusual inscription of a, what is this, kids? Do you know? What kind of crater is this? Anybody want to answer? How about Stegosaurus? Okay, because it has the bony plates on the back. Now, how would they have known what a Stegosaurus looked like unless they had seen one? Because they didn't have books back then saying millions of years ago, dinosaurs roamed the earth and here's what one of them looked like. In England, in Northern England, is the Carlisle Cathedral. It houses the tomb of Bishop Richard Bell. He died in the year 1496. Okay, four years after Columbus. His uh, grave has a carpet over it, and, but around the actual grave, they were to lift the carpet away, there is a brass plate that goes around it, and on this brass plate, there is carvings of a long sauropod critter with long neck and long tail. Okay, would you like a little something closer to home? I've got it. If you were to go up to the Natural Bridges National Monument in the southeast corner of Utah, under the Kachina Bridge, there is a, pec a pictograph, okay, petroglyph, of a long-necked sauropod dinosaur. This is my wife. She's looking up at it. It's right there at this point on the cliff. And if you get up closely, 
you can see it. Now, just to help highlight it, I will illustrate. That is what the pictograph looks like. Now, some scientists have studied this, okay, both secular and Christians. The secular people say, well, yeah, it looks kind of like that. It must have been, they must have been carving something, and then another, somebody came by and carved something over the top of it. Other people looked at it and said, no, this looks like it's very authentic because, again, there's, after so many hundreds of years, an oxidation forms, and it said, this thing, is, this thing is genuine, okay? It is not a forgery or a fraud. But the evolutionists have no explanation. And if you were to go to Natural Bridges National Monument and you ask anybody about this, they'll just say, sorry, sir, we don't know. They don't want to talk about it. They won't direct you to it. But if you know how to look for it, you can find it. And my wife and I have hiked down there three different occasions and photographed it. So we know it's there. We know about the Chinese zodiac. Of course, we've all had at least maybe one meal in a Chinese restaurant, and there's all these things. And then there's this thing about the dragons. Well, why don't we see any dragons or dinosaurs today? It is possible, too, that some of these huge flying reptiles, the pterosaurs, also survived Noah's flood and lived into a recent times. The Illustrated London News of February 9th, 1856, which, okay, that's not recent, recent, but 1800s, reported that workmen digging a railway tunnel in France last century disturbed a winged creature at Colmont and whatever, while blasting rock for the tunnel. The creature was described as livid black with a long neck and sharp teeth. It looked like a bat and its skin was thick and oily. It died soon after. Its wingspan was measured at 3.22 meters, about 10 feet, 7 inches. A naturalist immediately recognized it belonging to the genus Pterodactylus anas, and it matched the remains of known pterodactyl fossils. Several scientific expeditions have taken place in the Likawala Swamp of Central Africa with the help and sponsorship of the Congolese government in an effort to verify reports of previously unidentified animals. One of these animals, known to the local natives as Mokale Mbembe, fits the description of a small plant-eating dinosaur. Biologist, biologist Dr. Roy P. Mackle from the University of Chicago has led some of these trips through the harsh, humid, swampy environments of the Congo. He's written a book about his excursions, which includes summaries from other researchers who have been on expeditions to the Congo's Likawala region. Now, as of yet, nobody's got a photograph of this, but you have to consider a couple factors. First of all, this Congo is a swamp, okay? And the swamp is about the size of Louisiana, okay? So it's a big, swampy area, and you have to go around by boat, and these creatures are kind of like, um, they're not really big on being around humans, okay? And the reason that the natives have seen them is because they have canoes and they can paddle around stealthily. But we go in there with motorboats and things like this. And if you were a creature that was kind of shy and afraid of strange noises and you heard a motorboat, you'd probably say, I'm out of here, and you would disappear. But when they interview the, the natives, they'll take a picture of different critters and they'll go through this. Does it look like this? No. Does it look like this? No. 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 And then they show them a picture of this and they say, that's the guy. That's Mokale Mbembe. How many of you are aware of what happened in the year 2005 regarding Tyrannosaurus rex and a Dr. Schweitzer? Anybody hear anything about that? Scientists from Montana State University report on the evidence which seems to strongly suggest that traces of real blood from a T. rex have actually been found. Real blood from a Tyrannosaurus rex. When the bones were brought to the Montana State University's lab, it was noticed that some parts deep inside the long bone of the leg had not completely fossilized. To find unfossilized dinosaur bone is already an indication more consistent with the young age for the fossils. Mary Schweitzer, the scientist most involved with this find, takes up the story of when her co-workers took turns looking through a microscope at a thin section of T-Rex bone, complete with blood vessel canals. This is a picture of Dr. Mary Schweitzer, and here's what she's going to say. The lab filled with murmurs of amazement, for I had focused on something inside the vessels that none of us had ever noticed before, tiny round objects, translucent red with a dark center. Then a colleague took one look at them and shouted, you've got red blood cells, you've got red blood cells. Schweitzer confronted her boss, famous paleontologist Dinosaur Jack Horner, with her doubts about how these could really be blood cells. Horner suggested she try to prove they were not red blood cells, and she says, so far we haven't been able to. She ran 17 different tests to try to prove that they were not red blood cells. Each time the test came back saying, no, they're red blood cells. It's not contamination, it's not something else. Well, people, red blood cells should not be able to survive 65 million years. 
So the evidence would indicate that the T-Rex bones were not millions of years old. But because of the scientist's bias for interpreting the data, right, their worldview, they were left with a big puzzle as to how to explain the finds. Well, we would say if we start with God's word, they simply weren't that old. They died in Noah's flood. Not a problem. So what about Noah? Psalm 104, verse 5, Thou didst set the earth on its foundation so that it should never be shaken. Thou didst cover it with the deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains. At thy rebuke they fled, at the sound of thy thunder they took to flight. The mountains rose, the valley sank down to the place which thou didst appoint for them. Thou didst set a bound which they should not pass, so that they might not again cover the earth. So, at the end of the flood, what was happening? Well, there were enormous plate tectonic movements. We had mountain ranges being formed. The subcontinent of India came up and slammed into the Asian plate, forming the Himalayas. We had in South America the Andes Mountains forming. In North America, we have the Pacific plate colliding in with the North American plate, and that created the, not only the Cascade Range, but the Rocky Mountains as well. But basically, we have the mountains rising and the valley sinking down and everything settling back down. Now, just to go into the dynamics of the flood is another whole talk in itself, okay, which we're not going to do here. But basically, the water that was covering the old earth receded back into the ocean basins. And then what happened? It came to pass that God said, okay, it's time to exit the ark. And they came out of the ark. Every beast, every creeping thing, every fowl, whatsoever creepeth upon the earth, after their kinds went forth out of the ark. And that would have included the reptiles, which would have included the dinosaurs, or as they were called at the time, dragons. So, the reason we don't have lots of dinosaurs living today is because, well, they became extinct. Okay? Simple as that. How come? Well, there's several different reasons. The ones that didn't die in the flood, okay, there was a destruction of their habitat, okay, because uh, as mankind is spreading out, if you have a dinosaur-like critter, okay, and he wants to eat your sheep or your livestock or your pet, uh, then you're going to want to eliminate that, okay? So the habitat was being destroyed, they were being hunted, and the climate also became very different after Noah's flood, and a lot of them probably were not able to adapt. Uh, interestingly enough, I was looking around recently just to do some supplemental research on this, and I came across this tract published by Southern Adventist University. And it was a tract, it's called the Origins Papers. This is paper number five, and I printed some of them off. And it's called Dinosaurs, could God have created such beasts? Well, you know, he created grizzly bears and he created alligators and crocodiles. So, you know, what's wrong with this? So Lee Spencer, who runs the biology department, uh, who's a member of the biology department at Southern Adventist University, and Dr. Art Chadwick, who is a paleontology specialist at Southwestern Adventist University, who, by the way, is also one of the scientists featured in the video is Genesis History, which we'll have available later this evening. Uh, he co-founded uh, an annual dinosaur dig in eastern Wyoming, and paleontologists of all stripes, secular and biblical, have uh, asked him to, uh, sh to model for them his method of dinosaur bone excavation because he uses GPS tracking coordinates, and they're able to very carefully and very accurately map in a three-dimensional form exactly where they find every bone in the bone layer as they're, as they're going through and digging them out. So it's quite interesting. But in this tract, it reads, Without a proper habitat, dinosaurs that survived the flood failed to thrive and eventually went extinct. After the flood, the Earth's habitat was changed. The Mesozoic habitats, which were extremely warm and ideal for large, cold-blooded reptiles, disappeared. Without a proper habitat, dinosaurs that did survive the flood failed to thrive and eventually went extinct. Based on these evidences and theories, this is what I say, it is likely that God indeed was the creator of dinosaurs. Actually, no, that was theirs. What I'm going to add is this. For in six days the Lord made heaven, earth, the sea, and all that is in them. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. John 1, verse 3. Gary Larson, who we talked about the other day, has his own theory as to why the real reason why dinosaurs became extinct. I'm not so sure. He also says... However, there was no question that on the south side of the river, the land was ruled by the awesome Tyrannosaurus Mex. Okay. Yeah, so much for Gary Larson. All right. In summation, we know that dinosaurs existed. Why? Because we have their fossil evidence. Dinosaurs were created on the same day as other reptiles. Why? We know that from God's word. Day 6, Genesis chapter 1. 
we know that reptiles were on the ark because Noah was instructed to take two of every kind or every sort. We know that behemoth matches a description of a large dinosaur. We know that dinosaurs were recorded in history as dragons. We have the dragon stories and legends. We have the Ica stones. We have dragons in art and literature. And we also have unfossilized dinosaur bones, which means that they were buried recently, which would have been during a flood, like the flood of Noah. And we know that many dinosaurs have since become extinct. We aren't really in a position to say all, because the only way we would know would be as if we could scour every square inch of the planet simultaneously and say, nope, none here. Okay. But what we can do is we can trust the biblical account. We can confidently make the Bible a foundation for our thinking in every area, because all the evidence comes together very neatly when we start and end with God's word. Psalm 119, 128 says, Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be read, and I hate every false way. So dinosaurs are not in conflict with the Bible. They are, in fact, missionary reptiles, okay? Because we don't have to let the evolutionists with their millions of years co-opt dinosaurs. We can say, no, dinosaurs, yeah, absolutely. Not a problem with dinosaurs. Dinosaurs can fit very easily in the biblical narrative. Essentially, it means that we can trust God's word, that he says what he means, and that he means what he says. And if you'd like, I do have a couple copies of these tracks here, which I could leave with you. In case you want to take it home for further study. Looks like I have extra copies in here. So we'll just go through them. Oh, some more dinosaur resources. And I don't have all of these available. I do believe I have one copy of Dinosaurs by Design. But there are other books as well. There are also some coloring books available. Uh, there are also some videos about dinosaurs. I, I don't have all of these available. But just you know that they exist. So if you were to go online and look for them, you could find them very easily. Wouldn't be a problem. I'm going to say thank you.